the basis or the foundation even of legitimate political authority is what we might call popular or democratic sovereignty. That is the notion that the people are the source of legitimate authority and the ultimate holders, so to speak, of legitimate authority. So as the source of legitimate authority, the people have a right or a say in how this authority is used and by whom. And so this implies, as Lincoln understood it, not, not everybody understood it the same way, but as Lincoln understood it, this implies republicanism. This implies, as Lincoln rephrased that, government of the people, by the people, and for the people, or what we would today call democracy. Hi, for this episode of Scholar Talks, the guiding question is how can we perpetuate American political institutions of self-government? Now, our guest, Michael Zucker, is a professor of political science at the University of Notre Dame and is uniquely qualified to answer this question. He has written extensively about political theory, constitutionalism, natural rights republicanism. He's the author of several books, including the newly published A Nation So Conceived, Abraham Lincoln and the Paradox of Democratic Sovereignty. I am Tony Williams, Senior Fellow at the Bill of Rights Institute, and I am pleased to bring you another episode of Scholar Talks in our series, Topics in Government and Civics. Michael, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Well, Tony, thank you for having me. I'm real happy to be here. All right. Now, now one of the reasons I, I, I love your, your new book, A Nation So Conceived, is is it examines Lincoln's speeches, his rhetoric, uh, but uh, you know it examines the political thought behind them as well as provides some really important and interesting historical historical context as well. It, it's really a, a remarkable achievement, right? And and in Thank the you. in the new University Press of Kansas Constitutional Thinking Series. So so well done, well done. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Great. Well, now, now I know a lot of the questions that, that I'm going to post to you, we can talk about for an entire semester in a college course, but we only have about 20, 25 minutes. So, so uh, we'll, we'll jump right in. Uh, but, but these are some big questions, but, but you're, you're, you're qualified to, to, to give us a concise answer. I hope so. so. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let me start maybe at the beginning, right? At the sort of the core question is, you know, why is all men are created equal? Why is that at the core of democratic sovereignty and American republicanism, according to Abraham Lincoln? Well, now this is this is uh, this is a topic very close to the center of my book, um, and uh, as I hope most of our listeners realize, this is a quotation from the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln's most famous speech. And, but in the Gettysburg Address, it's also a quotation from the Declaration of Independence, the other sort of, I'd say, prime document of American political history. So we have these two documents coming together somehow in this particular place. So in, in, um, in his Gettysburg Address, Lincoln says something like, you know, four score, so not just simply like, but he says, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to that proposition that all men are created equal. And the question I think is, well, what did Lincoln mean by that? Um, I think the first thing is, the first thing he meant by that is, is to this effect that no human being is born with some sort of inherent right or some sort of talent or ability or gift or any natural quality that gives that person a right to rule other people. That's the basic thought. All men are equal in that sense. And Lincoln, along with Jefferson, who wrote that same phrase in the Declaration, recognized that people are unequal in other ways, but none of those other ways grants a right to anybody to rule anybody. Jefferson said, the mass of mankind has not been born with saddles on their backs, nor a favored few booted and spurred, ready to ride them legitimately by the grace of God. The same claim really said in a somewhat more, um, uh, how should we say, uh, visual way. So in the Gettysburg Address, in, in his whole career, this uh, phrase, this clause had an obvious application 
to, on the issue of race-based slavery. I mean, it's clearly a, a claim that this kind of slavery is illegitimate. Um, and but in in Lincoln's thinking, it had a a broader appeal or a broader application as well. Um, it raises the question. Where does legitimate authority come from? Where does governmental authority come from? If it comes from anywhere, is there legitimate authority ever? So Lincoln, just as he took the phrase from the Declaration of Independence, he looked to the Declaration for the answer. And the Declaration says, uh, governmental power comes from the consent of the governed. So the consent of the governed, that's the answer. Um, and this implies that the basis or the foundation even of legitimate political authority is what we might call popular or democratic sovereignty. That is the notion that the people are the source of legitimate authority and the ultimate holders, so to speak, of legitimate authority. So as the source of legitimate authority, the people have a right or a say in how this authority is used and by whom. And so this implies, as Lincoln understood it, not, not everybody understood it the same way, but as Lincoln understood it, this implies republicanism. This implies, as Lincoln rephrased that, government of the people, by the people, and for the people, or what we would today call democracy. Uh, so that's, that's the connection. There's a kind of close connection between the, the claim that all men are created equal, the claim that the system rests on democratic sovereignty and the claim that the proper regime is a republic or as we think of them as a democracy. But what's interesting in my next question is that you also point out that there is uh, an enduring paradox, if you will, of, of democratic sovereignty as you point out in the subtitle of your book. Can you talk a, a little bit about that? Maybe this is the, the, the central uh, insight or new thing anyway that I wanna claim about Lincoln that the big issues that concerned Lincoln in his uh, political career um, involved what I call in the book, the paradox of democratic sovereignty. And the paradox is something like this. This notion of democratic sovereignty that, that we've been talking about, uh, as Lincoln understood it, this stated the true, the true base, basis of political life. That is the true uh, uh, proper, political grounding of governance altogether. However, however, and this was a big however, and it was the source of the problem as Lincoln saw it, it is readily misunderstood and in ways that challenge legal government. And this readily, this ready understanding is related to the nature of the doctrine of popular sovereignty or democratic sovereignty. So there's a natural tendency to do so. And therefore, he saw it not merely as a problem of his moment, but a likely recurring problem in democratic life. He saw at least three different versions of these misunderstandings that organized uh, his political uh, activity. Um, let me mention uh, the first was, is one that he took up uh, as a very young man. Um, and I'd call that populism the problem of populism, something that we've had a kind of rebirth of. And so it's interesting to talk about now. Um, so populism, Lincoln was concerned in a very early speech of his with the problem of mob rule or mob action. But it turns out he wasn't interested in just mob, any old mob, you know, not interested in people who go to uh, uh, Best Buy stores and, and steal televisions. That's not what he meant. He meant mobs as groups of people who take the law into their own hands and act in place of the law. And when you begin to think about what this, what, what's the source of this problem, um, the source of the problem is the doctrine of popular sovereignty. Because if the people believe that they are the source of legitimate authority, that political power ultimately is theirs and rests in their hands, then Lincoln is like, then, no, sorry, then the people are, are tempted constantly to take the law into their own hands if they don't believe the governing authorities are doing the proper job. And Lincoln gives some analyses of some instances in his time in which this happened. But I'm, you know, I'm thinking particularly of similar event in our history, 
right now, recent history, um, January 6th. One of the things that, uh, one of the chants or slogans that the uh, people who were uh, attacking the Capitol were, were uh, singing was our house, our house. This was, a, this captured the very idea that Lincoln is getting at here. The people who were doing that were saying, look, this belongs to us. We have a right to intervene here when we think something uh, is not happening that should, that, that, that's wrong. Uh, and so that's example, an example of the populist danger that he saw at his time. Um, another that he saw was the problem of popular sovereignty as developed by Stephen Douglas in the, uh, and, and which came to a head in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, the very famous Lincoln-Douglas debates. And so those debates, or the doctrine of popular sovereignty, I should say, Douglas, Douglas aversion thereof, was an attempt to settle a very um, troubling problem that was uh, uh, roiling political life in the 1850s. And that was the problem, should slavery be allowed to expand into the territories of the United States, those parts of the United that United were owned by the United States, but were not yet formed as states. Lincoln thought not. Lincoln thought not, and the reason he thought not was because all men are created equal, and slavery is wrong according to that principle, and therefore it should not be extended. Douglas, on the other hand, said, "Let's take the position of principle, the dominant ruling principle of America, which is self-government, which is." Um, popular sovereignty, i.e. that people, that the people rule. And let's say, let's let all the local authorities, the territorial governments settle the issue of whether they'll have slavery or not. And this meant to, this was meant by Douglas to solve some political, to solve the political agitation that was going on in Washington, take it away from Washington and return it to the, to the territories. He thought that this was not merely uh, going to settle the political waters, but was the right thing, was the right principle of self-government for this country. Um, and what Lincoln responded was that this doctrine, this version of popular sovereignty, the basis of that doctrine, as I tried to explain a minute ago, is the principle, all men are created equal. If all men are created equal is the principle upon which popular sovereignty rests, then you cannot vote against all men are created equal on the basis of popular sovereignty. It cannot validate, uh, it cannot, I should say, invalidate the principle on which it rests. And therefore, Lincoln tried to point out what a complete self-contradiction and in, in a way nuttiness the, the Douglas's version of this was. Nonetheless, the idea that the people rule and can do whatever they feel is right, um, uh, that's a natural tendency in a system like, th like this. If government is a voluntary activity, and in the U.S. we particularly um, uh, made that visible when in adopting the Constitution, we had uh, a ratification conventions. Appeals, direct appeals to the people to ratify, that is to consent to the Constitution. Well, the interesting thing is, is that when the Southerners were seceding, they engaged in the exact opposite reverse process. They had de-ratification conventions, in effect, or secession conventions, in which they went, they took the same process and they just reversed it. And they said, we joined in this way, we're going to, we're going to leave it in this way. And this is a kind of application of the principle of consent. <laughs> if consent is the basis of um, uh, government, then how about dissolving it by consenting to leave it? And that's the issue, that's the claim that they were that they were raising. What virtues, what civic virtues does Lincoln think are necessary for self-governance in the people, you know, individually as they literally self-govern themselves and their passions, uh, but then uh, also as members of the political community? Yeah, good. That, that's a really good question. And of course, th this is one Lincoln didn't address quite as uh, systematically as the uh, previous ones we've talked about. So. I have to kind of infer things here and there of what he's what he what, what he might, might answer to this. I would say, in a way, the first one would be the acceptance of the principle and of its implications that all men are created equal. Um, in a way, the Gettysburg Address, his most famous speech, that's what it's about. It's about the dedication of the founders to that principle and how we need 
to rededicate ourselves to it and extend it when necessary. Um, and so I would say that's the first thing. That's the first thing. The second thing would be the acceptance of the rule of law and constitutional interpretation uh, institutions that um, follow from that principle of all men are created equal. Thirdly, I would say um, an alertness to the behavioral <laughs> uh, prerequisites of self-government. So for example, an attentive citizenry, that the citizenry has to pay attention to what the governors are doing. And um, you know, it's uh, impressive to me, to a lot of people, that Lincoln and Douglas would have these debates that go on for three hours. And the people would sit out there in the you know the heat and uh, it, it without too much good public address system also, and listen to these guys go on for so long. I mean, can you imagine an American audience today doing something like that? It's hard to imagine. Um, I would say a, a fourth kind of thing: um, respect uh, for. Um, those things which I would call prerequisites of self-government. So for the basic rights of others, respect for freedom, you know, for Bill of Rights things that really fit your, your institution's agenda. I mean, respect for free speech, the right of free speech, very important, uh, which un unfortunately is in a kind of odd sort of danger today. Uh, freedom of religion, another important, another important virtue required, uh, respect, for others, the other safeguards in the Bill of Rights. Uh, a fifth thing um, th that maybe isn't always appreciated, that Lincoln saw the self-government as not really requiring certain virtues in the people, but as promoting certain virtues in the people, which he thought were on the whole good. So it promotes um, industriousness. That is when people have an opportunity to do things uh, it brings out their talents and their abilities and develops their faculties. And he thought this is, in a way, the best thing about uh, free government. That's the role of, of the citizenry. And according to Lincoln, you know, what's the role of, of the statesman in preserving uh -huh. self-government, you know, whether through constitutionalism and, and prudence and, and, mm -hmm. and rhetoric and so forth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, another, another good question. Another one that he didn't so much address explicitly, but which he, we think, embodied to a great degree. And, um, but one, one so, so, but I think he would say that it's very difficult to give a definitive answer to this question because the needs of statesmanship are very circumstantial. Tell a, a quick little story that uh, I think illustrates uh, statesmanship as Lincoln practiced it. So, early, earlyish in the war, um, you know, he had this general McClellan who was the chief general. And he had a lot of problems with McClellan because McClellan would never fight. Um, and Lincoln knew he wasn't, that he didn't know a lot about war, but he knew that you're not gonna win a war if you don't fight. Um, and so he was concerned about McClellan. So one night he was out and he went over to McClellan's house. He wanted to talk to him. And he had with him his military attache. It turns out McClellan was out, out at the opera or somewhere. And so Lincoln said, all right, I'll wait for him. And so he sat in the parlor, the front parlor, the back parlor, whichever one they sit, they used to sit in. And uh, he was sitting and he was sitting and he was sitting. And then eventually a servant came down and said, uh, General McClellan has gone to bed. And I mean, this is an amazing thing. <laughs> you know, the commander in chief, this he's just insulted him in an astonishingly powerful way. And the attache, what Lincoln should react in, you know, some sort of big huff. But interesting, Lincoln just went home and did nothing. And the attache was astonished at that and thought this was some sort of something, something strange by Lincoln. How Lincoln defended himself is he said, McClellan is the best general I've got and I can't afford not to have him now. And so under those circumstances, Lincoln swallowed his pride, took this insult, and stuck with McClellan. When other, under other circumstances, the right thing to do, and I'm pretty sure he would have done it, would to be dismiss McClellan on the spot. But so, but there's no, you know, there's no rule. This is the one thing that you need to do. But one of the things I think it shows a, a quality of statesmanship that is needed is um, the ability to control your passions. Uh, 
I'm sure he was pretty insulted. I'm sure he was, you know, this was, he, he took it for what it was. But he, you know, he took it because he, he knew that the country or the, his presidency required it at that moment. So a kind of self-control, I think that's a really important, a really important part of it. Another thing I think that's important and that Lincoln uh, exemplified is to know your own strengths and your own limits. He knew he was a wonderful speaker and he took advantage of that. But he also knew, for example, that he didn't know much about fighting wars. And so he did the best he could. I mean, there was a big deficiency uh, in the circumstances, but he did the best he could. To he took out books from the Library of Congress about, about wars. And he, uh, he deferred to the generals when he had to. He pushed them when he could. Um, and he looked always for a general that would actually fight. And then finally he found this, you know, Sherman, Grant, et cetera, Sheridan, I mean, group of generals who really did what needed to be done. But the third thing that I, that I would say would be that, that Lincoln did, don't demonize your opponents. He really was, he really understood that to demonize them just gets them angry and makes it, makes them worse than, than they were before. Um, and this is very visible in the way he spoke of the Southerners. Um, he, he didn't approve of slavery and he didn't approve of their having slaves. But on the other hand, he tried to be understanding of their situation. And he said in one place, uh, we're no better than they would be if we were in their situation. Um, and ha this was a kind, of, uh, a kind of thing he said about other groups as well. And the fact is, his private views of the Southerners was off, were often harsher than his public views, but that's, that's the way he was. And then I, I'd say one final thing, um, tend to the vision thing. Uh, what uh, the first President Bush, I think, spoke of as the vision thing. Um, and Lincoln was great, you know, Lincoln was great about the vision thing. That was maybe his greatest, his greatest com uh, achievement. Um, but that as he understood it, and I think he, as he practiced it, statesmanship involves a kind of teaching and preaching. And um, as much as formulating public policy, maybe more. Uh, and so in a popular regime, this is particularly important because the people have to be, uh, they have to believe in what this country is about. And so uh, that's a statesman has to do that as well. I argue in my book somewhat, I think it's going to be um, one of the controversial features of the book that, that actually Lincoln um, was right, uh, constitutionally correct in the p positions he took, that he did not in fact play fast and loose with the constitution, but that's another, that's another story. Anyway, so those are a few things that I think Lincoln shows in his statesmanship and that are um, of continuing lasting value. Right. Well, it's an excellent list. Uh, and my, my final question uh, goes back to the question we posed at the very beginning, our guiding question. How can we perpetuate American political institutions of self-government, you know, according to Lincoln? Good. Well, you know, that seems to me uh, similar to the um, to the statesmanship question in the sense that the challenges that the country faces are different at different times. So, for example, when Lincoln uh, when Lincoln was president, almost all the problems were domestic. We had no pressing foreign policy problems. During the Cold War, uh, there were pressing foreign policy problems, or certainly during World War II. Uh, so, what's needed at different times varies, I think, according to the circumstances. But I would say in, 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 in concluding that there are certain abiding things that perhaps we could say, or that Lincoln would say. One, um, respect the law and the constitution. I personally, in the hard times that we've been through recently, I thought if we stick to the constitution, we'll be okay. And I think that's proved to be true. Um, and secondly, take seriously the principle that all men are created equal and what it and all things it implies, and as Lincoln understood it, implied a lot of things, uh, including you know political liberty, a lot of economic liberty, uh, religious liberty, uh, um, 
no imperialism. He was very opponent, opposed to imperialism, uh, things like that. And uh, I think those, if we if we keep those two things in mind, uh, we can preserve, perpetuate our institutions. So I hope. Uh, hey, uh, we hope to. So uh, yeah. Michael Zucker, it's been a real honor, and I want to thank you very much for joining me. Uh, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. And thank you all for joining us on this episode of Scholar Talks. Check out our other interviews in the series Topics in Government and Civics, as well as our other series on the American presidency and our series on the Cold War and, and the presidency. Thank you.